So let's open the uh, Wednesday, November 6, 2004 meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Um, first order of business is public comment. Uh, we take public comment in order to kind of inform the board, um, be alerted to problems, et cetera, in the district. Also, just to get feedback. Uh, we don't respond in real time, um, but it's very important to our decision making process. So, if we don't respond, it's not because we're not listening and we're not taking account of the information. Uh, it's again very important to our decision making. And if specific problems are brought to our attention, we definitely um, try to find ways to follow up. So, uh, public comment from anyone in the room? There you go. Hi, I'm Tina Muncy, and I'm a resident of Montpelier. And I noticed that on your agenda today, you're looking at the survey of uh, what people thought about the, what to do with the Roxbury building. And I'd like to say, I absolutely think the best thing to do is to give it to the town of Roxbury. When I say give it, I know in the merger agreement, it said a dollar and that seems like a good deal. And uh, what I would ask you to think about though is um, that it might be time to draw a line in the sand about when Roxbury has to decide. Um, whether they're going to buy the building or not, because we could sell it and put that money into the budget. I don't think that's the best thing to do with that building. I think it belongs to Roxbury. But I think as uh, someone who lives on a fixed income in Montpelier, um, I don't think it's fair to ask me anymore to pay for the upkeep and the maintenance of the building. So I think it's time to say, you know, it's the first of next year or before the next school vote, Roxbury should decide. So thank you for listening and thank you for what you do for the children in this district. Let's do that. <clears throat> although I said we don't respond in real time, I just do want to give an update and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that the Roxbury Select Board met and they have just, they have put in place a process to bring that question to the voters on town meeting day? Yes, yeah. because the select board wants to represent the will of the majority, not just make unilateral decisions. Yeah. So town of Roxbury is making steps to basically get approval. So to the residents. Roxbury residents, yes. And the choices will be keep the building or sell it? I think they're just asking for authority to sell the building. To purchase. To, pur to purchase the building. To yeah. To purchase. And my understanding is they don't need that authority, but just given the commitment yeah, to the I town, that they, yeah. they want the, the blessing of the. Of the uh, anyone, anyone else from public comment? Anyone online? Let's see any hands or, oh, wait, hold on. Yep, Tom Frazier. Oh, Tom. Tom, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah I'm unmuted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, before the, I just wanted to bring up two, two uh, points about the survey. First of all, the Montpelier population is 12 times Roxbury's. So any survey uh, really has, has, has limited validity um, in terms of um, fairness to the town of Roxbury. We, uh, we just don't have the numbers. You've always had the numbers and, and consequently always had the power. Um, I think that if the town itself were surveyed separate from Montpelier, the, the situation would be much different. I mean, we misunderstood, I think, when you had your last meeting in Roxbury. I don't know, for some reason, we were so naive as to think that you were surveying us, not the whole, not the whole uh, district. So, you know, there's no, there's no question but what, you know, someone like Tina Muncy is um, pushing this. And 
those are the people that respond to the survey. I don't know how many actual Montpelier residents or voters responded to the survey. You only had 293 out of a population of total population of over 8,000. So it's, it's not even statistically valid. So um, I hope that you will just forget about the survey and make the decision based on fairness to the town of Roxbury, which is, you know, we, we entered into the agreement with you in good faith and we would like to be treated with good faith from this point on. The select board has decided to put the vote to, a t the, to the town to uh, take the building back and that'll happen at town meeting. So, you know, for Tina to say it's time for Roxbury to decide, it's time for the school board to decide when they're gonna offer it to the town. Um, and that has to be done before the Montpelier can sell the building and keep the money. So let's let's just get everything in order here and not use this survey to um, make a decision that's really based on, uh, well, I won't say false numbers, but uh, percentages that are so low that they're just not statistically viable. Thank you, Tom. Um, any other, anyone else online? Um, consent agenda is next item. Consent agenda is where we approve uh, a pro forma business that doesn't warrant um, individual discussion or consideration. Uh, it's a time-saving item. If there is something that someone has a question about or feels warrants more discussion, um, that member can pull the item off. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Do you have a second? I'll second. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Uh, super quick note on the facilities um, uh, committee meeting on October 28th. Um, Andrew offered to give us uh, tours of the different school buildings. So uh, we're going to take him up on that. It's probably going to be like some weekdays around lunchtime. Any other board members, I'll, I'll send something out. But uh, I apologize that that might be tricky. Um, but that's probably what it's going to be. So I'll send out some um, heads up about that if anybody else wants to participate. And I highly recommend if you can go go if you haven't done it yet with Andrew because you see the buildings through a completely different set of eyes and learn a lot about our buildings and plus you get to go in the basement and it's fun in UES. Great. Scary at MSMS. <laughs> Just to be real. <laughs> uh, tours, will they be worn the, uh... Committee meetings? I don't know. What I don't think they have are. to be they worn. Don't... I mean, because we're not doing business. So how, yeah, I guess how will we know Send out, you can send out an email on that. You can send an email on the board. Okay, the cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jake, I thought we had talked about having before a board meeting. Um, he said we do Roxbury before a board meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the Montpelier, a good point. That, and then the Montpelier ones we do probably a weekday lunch back. Okay, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about Roxbury. Uh, any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, next is Jess to discuss our draft equity plan. Hey. Um, I guess I'll just get started. Um, so, Good evening, folks. Um, so just before we dive in, I just want to note, right, I, this will be about a 10 or 15 minute presentation. Um, and that is not reflective of the importance or the value of this work. Um, as you can see, my wonderful central office colleagues are here as well, just to really demonstrate that this is work that we um, really think of as collective work and are really centering and prioritizing. Um, so I just wanted to name that. So two hopeful goals for tonight is really to think about what is our collective understanding of race, anti-racism and equity within MRPS, and then starting to preview a little bit of the 
strategic anti-racism and equity plan, which you got a draft of. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Libby. <laughs> yeah, um, I was slow on the go. Sorry. As we move into this work, I think one really important note is we're thinking about taking a really inclusive view of anti-racism and equity at work, right? So when we think about equity, we want to see it from a multitude of lenses, knowing that it spans everything from our curriculum and our development of that curriculum to thinking about discipline and how we create discipline referrals um, and how we interact with students and families, right? So it's really uh, spanning a lot of our work and touching and really thinking about it as a lens through which we see our work rather than specific identities or backgrounds or really specific sort of separate anti-racism work um, and equity work, really situating it as a lens through which we see um, education. <clears throat> Um, getting into more of building our collective understanding, understanding of anti-racism and equity, um, and I'm going to name it and we're going to talk about it as anti-racism and equity to really center anti-racism work, um, since that's something that often gets ignored or left to the side. So as I, you know, say anti-racism and equity, that's really intentional um, as a lens through which we're going to do equity work. So when we think about equity, we're going to think about both institutional equity and also interactional equity. So I'll start with institutional. So when we're thinking about our institutions, we're thinking about what are the systems, policies, regulations that are impacting the student experience and equity or inequity within our systems, right? So that's things like our multi-tiered systems of support. How do students access tier three intervention? How do we make referrals to special education? Um, how do we make uh, discipline referrals? And what does that mean for how our systems are impacting students and particular groups of students? Um, and that feeds in and is impacted by interactional equity, which really looks at the person individual experiences. So that's looking really more specifically at when we walk through our doors, when we interact with one another, how are individual experiences? Whereas institutional equity is really about our systems lens, right? And we know that those um, reinforce one another, right? So when we have systems that are inequitable and create inequitable outcomes, for example, if we have a discipline system that is more likely to suspend a student with a disability, then that reinforces our lens of um, and our bias towards students with disabilities, right? And then that impacts the way that we then interact with students with disabilities, right? So we know that this is a self-fulfilling cycle. So when we're thinking about anti-racism and equity work, we wanna think about it through these two, both institutional and interactional. So we get to both the systems and also are attending to the individual student and staff and community member experiences. Thank you, Libby. You're welcome. Um, can you just hit one more time? I love putting in all of all of the uh, animations here. Um, so when we're thinking about our equity plan, it's going to include three major things. So it'll include how we're defining anti-racism and equity, um, which we sort of just talked about, right? We're really thinking about it through the institutional and the interactional mm -hmm. lens. So it's the first thing that it sets up because we know that that's really critical if we're gonna do this work that we need to be speaking the same language and using the same um, lens to do this. And then we're also gonna be really specific with how are we approaching this work? Um, and I'll get into that more in the next slides, but what are we, you know, we think about how we define anti-racism and equity work as one piece and then thinking about, okay, so then how do we actually approach doing this work within our systems and with individuals? Um, and then finally, it'll have our MRPS goals and action steps, which really outline and clarify what are the specific things that we're going to do and get that, how are we going to measure our progress towards doing those things? So really the purpose, right, is to have a really clear and shared vision of what this work looks like and what it entails for us across the district. Um, 
as a reminder, I think all of you know, right? We had a few equity audits. We had the um, ability challenge audit. We have looked at disproportionality and opportunity gaps within our data. Um, we have talked to both a leadership team and with staff and faculty, um, what are equity needs? What are we seeing as needs? Um, and then also have gotten feedback based on lived experiences of those in our community, learners, caregivers, faculty and staff, family members. So when creating and drafting this plan, it was very much created based on the feedback, right? I by no means just pulled up in my office and decided to write a plan, right? It was very much situated in the feedback that we've gotten. Um, in addition to that, I've started to do um, feedback cycles. So I've gotten some feedback from like the middle school teacher. So Viva has already seen this presentation um, and uh, have gotten some feedback from instructional assistants. I was able to spend some time with some students last week and creating some plans too to get student feedback. Um, so really thinking about how do we ensure that we're having cycles of feedback for this living document, knowing that it'll sort of be a perpetual draft that we are constantly revising based on our needs, um, and also really centering uh, the voices of the most marginalized um, in our community in order to make sure that we're uplifting and making space for those voices, and those are directly informing this work. So we have five goal areas. Um, these are the big buckets that as an admin team, we felt like sort of encompassed the big areas of the feedback that we have gotten. So what we did was looked at the feedback from the equity audit, feedback from faculty and staff, all of the feedback that I listed on the previous slide and thought about how do we represent these in different buckets of work to start to organize some of this work. So you'll see we have five specific goal areas, foundational and collective understanding of anti-racism and equity. That's really around what is the basic anti-racism and equity knowledge that we need, right? So what are the things about our identities and the bias? How do we reflect on those in order to do this work? Um, understanding of how oppression manifests within the public school system, right? All of those are really foundational if we're gonna move together as a community to do this work. Then thinking about learner experiences and outcomes. So what is our system producing? What outcomes for students? And how do we break those down by demographics to see the equity implications? Really thinking about how do we ensure we're fostering belonging and community across those in our community, right across um, learners, faculty and staff, community members. Thinking about accessibility and inclusion of our spaces, of our curriculum et cetera, and then thinking about transparency and accountability, how do we measure and track this work and make sure that we're doing it in a way um, that is accessible and available so folks can help us keep track of this really important work. So each of these, so we have the five goal areas. For each of these goal areas, um, we are looking to break down each goal area into three really specific goals. So bear with me, I'm gonna try to explain this in a way that's clear, right? So for example, if we have foundational and collective understanding of anti-racism and equity, um, we are gonna have a goal around the individual experience, right? We'll have a goal under foundational and collective understanding around our systems work and tending to the systems needs. And then we'll also have a goal around skills and knowledge. Through doing that, we're trying to get sort of a, a multifaceted approach that thinks about the individuals, our big systems, really thinking about the institutional and interactional equity pieces, and then also what are the things that people need to know and know how to do in order to really do this work, right? So each of these five goal areas in the draft you'll see has an individual experience, a systems goal, and a skills and knowledge goal. And then under each of these goals, we have um, like a what, a why, and a how, right? So the what is to really clarify, what is this goal? What does it entail? The why is, why is this important? How does this directly relate to anti-racism and equity? 
Um, and then the how or what are the specific action items that we're going to make sure that we're doing in order to make progress on this goal. And then there's also this, and how are we make sure this happening, really speaking to the need for accountability and tracking this work over time to make sure that this doesn't just become a nicely written document that is public, but is also something that we're constantly tending to and really centering this work to make sure that equity then becomes a piece, a major piece um, and foundational to the work that we're doing across the district. So some preview of some of the action items, if you didn't have time to read um, the draft, right? So thinking about um, sort of smaller scale things, like how do we make sure that we have an incident response outline? So if an incident of harm happens, that we have a consistent and known and expected way to tend to that. Um, thinking about school-based collective commitment. So how are we gonna think about how we treat each other, especially when we're having harder conversations um, to culturally responsive caregiver communication guidelines? What does partnering with families look like? What does that look like when we're doing so in a culturally responsive way to increasing equity training um, and professional development for all staff? And then all the way to sort of the major work that Libby is leading for us, really thinking about how do we create an instructional framework that is inclusively designed, that's asset-based, um, that's culturally responsive. So how do we shift our teaching um, across the district, knowing that it is very much happening in a lot of ways across our teachers who are very skilled, right? Many of them are doing this work, but how do we do this in a way that becomes part of our system so we can guarantee that everyone in our district is teaching in a way that is culturally responsive, asset-based, et cetera. Um, and then thinking about translation and of course, how do we um, diversify our faculty and staff across our district as a major piece as well. So you may be thinking, how do we track this, right? Which is a really fair question. And I think something that is really challenging when we're thinking about anti-racism and equity work. So two of the ways that we're playing with and diving into, and I know we've talked um, to you all about disproportionality and the opportunity gap. Um, and these are two ways that we can look at uh, mostly our institutional or systems work that we're doing and what is the impact of our work on our systems and how is it then impacting student experience? So right, so we're on the left side, we're thinking about disproportionality as a reminder, that's the over or under representation of students of a particular identity or demographic, right? So if we, let me, if you click one more time. Again, love the animations, thank you. Right, so that looks like, um, for example, students eligible for free and reduced lunch are more likely to require tier three academic services here at MRPS. So we know because of our systems, Right, students um, who are free and reduced lunch are less likely to be at the grade level per, um, proficiency and therefore overrepresented in the students who are accessing tier three services, right? So that's one example of disproportionality and how we can use it to see what are the impacts of our system and how do we tune them and shift them to make sure that whether you are a student with free and reduced lunch or not, you are reaching academic proficiency based on our system and versus the opportunity gap, um, which is one way to measure the differences in outcomes. And again, I um, provided an example if you wanna click one more time. Um, so this helps measure the differences between particular demographics or lived experiences. So for example, belonging across their district for students accessing special education, 59% of those students report high levels of belonging in our district versus students who don't access special education, and this is district-wide, 69% um, of students report high levels of belonging, right? So our opportunity gap in that is 10%, right? And again, we use the term, term opportunity gap versus something like um, the achievement gap, because it makes sure that we're continuing to look for root causes. We're thinking about our system rather than blaming the individual student for not being able to feel like in this case, they belong within our system. Okay, did a lot of talking at you. 
So I have a question for you all now, right? So anti-racism and equity work is going to be ongoing, right? Particularly as educators, we constantly will be looking to expand, shift, nuance, complicate our understanding of anti-racism and equity work. So last animation of the night, um, there is board policy about equity that talks about needing um, an annual training. So I would just encourage you all, you often ask us, what can you all do? So I would ask you all to think about what are the trainings that you all want um, as you think about this work, as you think about um, your place in your in our equity plan, what's what's the training that you all need or you know want or think would help you with this work? Okay. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Scott. I really appreciate the, the last animation and the question embedded within it. Um, I, I'm wondering, and and um, um, try this again. Mia, maybe, and Lynn, maybe what we could do is is have a conversation in our our equity committee meeting about what, and, and maybe even invite you to join us for a conversation about what what are the things that would be. Um, helpful for us as a board to to um, get a better understanding of. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Um, I first wanted to just say thank you because this is a great deal of work. The presentation didn't even scratch the surface. I'm glad that the report or the um, plan, the draft plan is accessible to the public just in, you know, if you can find it in the, you know, meeting documents for today's meeting. Um, and it's because it's huge. It's just huge. It's a ton of work to have sifted through all those different areas that we got feedback in. And this is the very first time that our district has a roadmap of this kind, which we've wanted for a very long time. So I'm, and I can think of no better time than now, given the current events for us to be fostering an environment where everybody feels like they belong and people are fully understanding the weight of racism in uh, the history of our country. So I'm really glad that this exists and I thank you very much for, for spearheading it. And I especially love all the detail on the within those goal, those areas of focus for the goals on who is responsible for them and how it's going to happen because that is what should it exist in a plan? So that's what's going to take this from our aspirations and our intentions and put it really into action. So that was my first thing because I just really wanted to um, say thank you for this. Um, I you also I want I have a couple of questions of curiosities. Um, you mentioned that the plan is drafted using feedback from lots of different areas, like in your iterations of the plan. Um, including caregivers. And I'm curious what method you use to get feedback from caregivers on the plan itself. Because I know a lot of caregiver feedback informed the plan from those other sources, but as you were drafting the plan. Yeah, I haven't had an opportunity to do that. Okay, honest. that's coming up next. Yeah, I see. and <laughs> that is part of the plan as well. Um, I, um, when thinking about the equity plan, it felt like it was important to start with teachers uh -huh. um, and gain that understanding of it and get feedback from there before I threw it out to the entire community. Yeah. Um, and that is not to underscore the importance of caregiver feedback as well. Yeah. I don't know if that's up. Great. Um, that'll be, I'll be really, really interested and excited to hear what we, what we learn from caregivers about, about the plan. Um, and then I noticed that there's um, a real focus on anti-racism, and I totally understand it. I also am curious about how students, for example, students free and reduced, receive free and reduced lunch or students living in poverty. How does that, there's not a whole lot of language addressing the, the needs of those students in this plan. So how does that work into the, work into the plan? 
Yeah, so one of the things I think we talked about quite a bit in drafting this plan is thinking about do we specifically name individual um, groups of marginalized identities and tend to their needs, or do we think about it more as an overarching um, plan, knowing that if we, for example, create um, instruction that is more accessible to multilingual learners, we will then also be addressing and making it more accessible um, for students with disabilities, for students who are accessing free and reduced lunch. Um, so that was an intentional um, choice around instead of specifically naming particular groups of folks and their needs, um, thinking about it more as an all-encompassing, um, you know, as we strengthen our and create a more inclusive instruction, as we create more sense of belonging or cross, um, we know that that will increase and support all students. And with that, right, we know that we're gonna be looking at disproportionality and the opportunity gap based on um, demographics and lived experiences. So uh -huh. we can track that over time and think about how do we then respond um, knowing if our opportunity gap doesn't decrease, right, then we can think about how do we specifically target particular um, groups based on their unique needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. I think so. I think what I hear you saying is that throughout the plan, you refer to students and, and in some cases staff with mar historically marginalized identities. And the way we can think about that then is students who are living in poverty are, are, we have, we definitely, as a society, marginalize poor people. So yes. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Okay. Tried to specifically use the umbrella term. Okay. Um, and also I didn't want to accidentally leave any group out or overrepresent one and under represent uh -huh. and then have some unintended messaging. Um, so thinking about using that umbrella term was intentional. Okay. Thanks. But that's a fair question. One that I'm very open to feedback on if anybody has any. I have other questions, but they're more detaily, and I just hope we have you back to talk more about it. We don't have I to. think that's the plan. We don't yes. have to get them and get all of my questions answered tonight. I think that we also, I mean, we have the equity committee at Scott. I don't mean to point at Scott as he's shoveling food in his mouth, but um, we do have the equity committee, and that might be a good mm -hmm. spot to do a deeper dive that yeah. Jess and I can come to. Yeah, great. Excellent. Any other questions, comments? No, thank you, Jess. It's great work, and really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Did you, you like some chocolate? I have any a lot of chocolate. All the chocolate is for all. Yeah. Um, the predicted budget pressures and priorities, mm. which I know we are all very waiting. aware of. All right. So tonight um, is kind of the first go at FY26 budget season. It's a little bit different than what has traditionally happened at the school board meeting. Traditionally, um, Christina would be taking that seat right there and saying to the board, what do you think the community can stand? And this is what we see as pressures. Um, so we have a little bit more detail for the board tonight um, because we're predicting that FY26 will be another very hard budget season. Uh, so just a reminder to the board and the community, this is our timeline. I recognize some of those are small, so I apologize to those in the audience who don't have this in front of them. Um, but tonight is the kickoff. We're talking about pressures and priorities. Um, our administration is already working on the FY26 budget behind the scenes. We're, develop we're in the very beginning process of developing that first draft to show you um, at the first board meeting in December. So whatever date that is, December 3rd. Next board meeting, we'll be talking with our dear friend Anna about a communications plan because that is another area that we are ramping up this year and doing in a much different and intentional way than we have in um, years past, which I think uh, based on the false narratives that were running around town last year across the state, I think that's very uh, needed this year to try to avoid that as much as possible. So in December, the board will see two different drafts. The very first draft, you'll give us feedback. Um, we will do revisions in between those meetings. The second meeting in December, you get a second draft based on the revisions. Oftentimes we get more exact numbers between those two drafts. So that's another place that we get 
revisions. And then the first uh, meeting in January is the third draft where it's pretty well done. Um, not completely cooked, but there's still time to do a little bit of revision in there. And then by the second board meeting in January, that's when the board has to make a decision to approve the budget because we need that much time to get it over to our town clerks in order to get it warned and all that kind of good stuff. So this is just the timeline. And then we'll have a public informational meeting on March 3rd and town meeting this year is on March 4th. So a little bit of overview for um, the board and the community. When we're talking about Vermont's educational finance system, we are talking about an incredibly complicated uh, finance system, possibly. As somebody who a national presenter said the other day, we don't usually say states are unique because they all think they're unique. No, Vermont's unique in how we finance education. We have revenue that comes in to our education fund from things like sales and use tax, property taxes, that kind of thing. Um, and then with the education fund, there's some of that money that we never see um, because there's uses that come out of the education fund that don't come directly to schools. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's, of course, education spending, which is what all the boards across the state of Vermont um, decide they need for education spending. That all goes into one big pot and then is split out from there. And Jake, if I misspeak in any way, shape, or form, I have the privilege of having an expert on my board or on this or Jill. So if I misspeak in any way or you want to add in, please do. So the use of the education fund. Um, so it does fund education, of course. It also funds universal school meals. So that money never actually comes to us. It's just funding it outside of us. It also funds early college tuition. So that was a statute change a few years ago. Um, so it funds that early college. Kids actually de-enroll, if that's a word. They disenroll, de-enroll, disenroll dis <laughs> from Montpelier High School. So they're no longer considered our students. And the education fund pays for their first year of college or whatever. And then they re-enroll right before graduation so that we, get a, we give them a diploma. Um, it also has after school funding coming out of the education fund. Uh, and then it has had PCB mitigation remediation, and that money is now all used up because of all the PCBs that have been found in schools. And so um, that did come off the top of the education fund, uh, but it's all used up when it, the legislature has set aside for that in the education fund. So now that shifts to local budgets. So if we move over to the cost shifts to local budgets, the um, state has pretty much level funded mental health needs of children and families. And we have seen a significant rise in mental health costs in our school budget because of that um, maintaining that the state has decided. We are really in Montpelier here in particular, the only game in town for mental health services for many of our students. So we have a we have a lot of social workers. We have a lot of counselors. We have a lot of services that we provide kids in-house. Uh, our vouchers to private pre-K comes out of our local budgets, which is a pretty large expense. All our facility needs, I say that's a shift. It's not a recent shift, but when the legislature decided to stop using um, state funding for school construction grants, that shifted all to us, right? So there, that is a shift to local budgets, just not a recent one. And now that PCB mitigation and remediation, if, if the way the law is currently as of today, if we were to find any PCBs in this building, then we would be on the hook for any mit mitigation and remediation needs. So that is shifted to our, the local budget at a significant cost, not a small one, a significant cost. Um, we're not actually going to watch this, but if you haven't seen and the, if the community hasn't watched this, our friend Lola du Dufort over at Vermont Public put together this great video as uh, the education finance. It's Lola in cartoon. It's really good. It's really easy to watch. So we just wanted to make sure that it was on that. And we'll make sure that it's on any budget web page we have, too, because it's pretty well done. Just a reminder of Act 127. We're still there. So last year, the... The weights changed for how they calculate our per pupil expenditures. Um, and that had significant impact on Montpelier Roxbury. We're now in year two of using these weights. And just a reminder that the significant changes came to students qualifying for free and reduced lunch and multilingual learners. 
MRPS numbers in those two areas have not significantly changed from last year. And in fact, our October 1 counts has a couple is some decreases in multilingual learners. Um, we will receive an eight cent tax decrease. Last year, it was 10 cent tax decrease when the legislature did all that stuff at the way end of the budget year to try to fix some mistakes in the law. So that's just a really brief overview of 127, but we all do not need to relive that experience from last year. Not tonight, no. Uh, this is just a, a chart to give the board a sense of where we stand in terms of our, our per pupil <laughs> expenditure in comparison to others in the state. So if I, I know it's really small from the board, from the screens perspective, hopefully people can see it at home a little better. That first yellow line is Harwood. Harwood's at over 15,000 per pupil. The next blue line that's highlighted, I just highlighted, I had Christina highlight some central Vermont places around us that we're often compared to. Stowe is just under 15,000 with 14.8. And then the next line down is Washington Central. They're at 14,380. Per, per pupil expenditure. And then that next line down is us, Mar Montpelier Roxbury. We're at 13,754 per pupil. The black line down below the, the middle there is the statewide average. The statewide average is 12,881. And then way down in the purple is Payne Mountain, which is Williamstown and Northfield. They spend 11,641 per pupil and Barry down below that is 11,036. Per weighted pupil. Per weighted pupil, yeah. yes. Yep, thank you. Yep, thank per you. weighted pupil. So um, we're up there. We're not as high up there as other school districts around us, or all the school districts around us, but we're, we're pretty up there. If I had Christina pull out the lines right below MRPS, they would be school districts like Mount Mansfield, Essex Westford, South Burlington, these places have a much larger student population than we do, and they spend about the same as we do per weighted pupil. Any questions on this one? No, it's helpful. Kind of a fun slide. I, I find it very helpful, and it's interesting to see how, why we are many lines above the state average, we're not that far to the right mm -hmm. of the state, state average. Interesting. Yeah, we're kind of on the high end of the average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the way the data are presented, it, it exaggerates the difference, right? So the 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 the, the graph is is not from zero to nineteen thousand. It's no. from seven, and so yeah. if you actually graphed it from uh, zero, uh -huh. the difference, the absolute difference, is only you know like ten percent, maybe mm -hmm. higher, which. Yeah, is is telling um, and helpful. Yeah, and so another interesting fact is just a fun fact that my brain is full of in budget season. But the bottom four lines are districts that do not have schools at all. So um, they don't have any schools. And the the fifth line is the first district that does has a school have a have school buildings, and it's Franklin the Northeast Enosburg mm -hmm. is the fifth line. Just a fun fact. Not for Unisburg, but so oh just in general, this is very general. We'll go into much more specifics in the first draft, um, but this is just very general taken from our FY25 numbers, how our budget is broken up, just so the board gets ready for where you have the most control here. Um, salaries and benefits takes up 75% of our budget. Buildings and grounds is 10%. Teaching resources, so that's curricular resources, technology, all of that kind of stuff that a teacher needs and uses is 10%, transportation is 3%, and co-curriculars is 2%. So if we're gonna take a look closer look at that salary and benefits. I love how Christina used orange and blue for my Syracuse University <laughs> colors. Thank you very much. Uh, salaries is over 16 million, and then benefits is 7 million. And then if we break that salary and benefits up even more, so this is salary and benefits combined again, the big green are our teachers. So we spend over $11 million in salary and benefits for teachers. Uh, the next largest category, uh, that's 67% of our salary and benefits line. The next largest categories are 8%, which is licensed administrators and instructional assistants. will take up about 8% of the budget. 
And then we start getting into smaller pots. Our support staff, which are kind of our administrative assistants in that kind of position, uh, take up 7% of our budget. And the custodial staff takes up 5%. Non-licensed administrators in that position is like the custodial supervisor or um, our community liaison, you know, people who play more of an administrative role, however, uh, do not have any <clears throat> license attached to their position. That's what that is. It's 3% of our budget. Um, and then there was one more, and then substitutes are about 1%. And then others like food service. And right, that's what you put in the other bucket, right? Yeah, and mm. So it's just an interesting look of like, that's most of our budget right there. That's where we have most of our money um, and how that's broken up. So this is a historical perspective of what we've done over the past few years. And I want to just make the um, statement before we anybody really digs into this is that the ta when you look at the tax rates, so much goes into what makes that tax rates. It's not just an even Steven, like this is what the school spends and therefore this is what the tax rate is. It, you know, it depends on the CLA and it depends on what the dollar yield was that year. It depends on lots of factors, the different weighting systems, like, so just bear that in mind. Um, but we went back a few years to find out what the budget was. So what was our education spending essentially um, for these years? So you can see that we've increased between 3% and last year was our high at 6.9% increase. That's when the weights changed. It also, if we remember, tanked the dollar yield, um, which doesn't help us in terms of tax rate. So um, that's what the history has been. Right now, Christina has some just numbers in that are not exact, and there are a lot of assumptions made, and we don't know what the dollar yield is, and we don't know what anything else is really that the state has to give us. But when she just calculates no additions, no reductions, just salary and benefit expectations and assumptions, then already we're at a 5.2% increase to our budget without having done anything. Not adding, not subtracting, nothing. We are at a 5.2%. So last year, our 6.9% equaled a 15% tax increase here in Montpelier. Um, so we can predict that a 5% increase is probably going to be up there as well if we don't make any other changes. And that's not, I don't mean to scare people with that number. It's just where, it's just the reality of where we are right now. Here's just the same tax rate history on our line graph. So you can see uh, the lighter blue um, is Montpelier and the darker blue is Roxbury. Just so you can see those and how they look over time. Our enrollment projection, as I told the board in, in previous board meetings, we were having a group called NESDEC do enrollment projections. They do enrollment projections for lots of districts across the state, including our neighbors at Washington Central. And uh, Stephen Deliger Pate over at Washington Central told me that they've been off over the last 10 years by three kids. So their enrollment projections are pretty good. <laughs> um, and this is their first go around with us. So of course they don't have any real historical data here, but other than what we've provided with actual numbers. Um, so they are gonna do it again. But our, this is actually pretty good news for us. Our enrollment is staying relatively steady. They're predicting our enrollment is staying relatively steady. What's not in here, now granted, I was reading a bridge article today, which wasn't hopeful, but what's not in here is any kind of building that Montpelier might have planned either. So any kind of housing that might be built at Country Club, over on the Country Club property or anything, if that ever happens, that's not part of these calculations. It's not considered here. So our enrollment right now is looking pretty steady. So over the next three years, NESDAC did say that the next three years are pretty solid numbers. And our kindergarten through grade eight is projected to remain stable, while our grades nine through 12 are expected to lose just a few kids, about 28. Yeah, the bubble's going through. Go ahead, Jim. Um, it looks like we're gonna lose tw uh, 24 kids next year. Is that in the green bar chart? Right here. That's a prediction from NESDAC. Is that, do you, do you feel like that's accurate? It's really hard to state. Um, because you get kids moving in, you get kids moving out. Um, and so it's really hard to state exactly what, if that's going to be a good one. It's, it's a probably good ballpark. Yeah. And you were just saying on the next slide, they said we would lose over the next three years, about 28 students. From nine through 12. And that 
K through K through eight will remain relatively stable. Uh -huh. So if you, can you go back to the bar chart for a sec? So, right. I think that that is what is also on these bars, essentially the 28 essentially over the next three years. Yeah. This is a big drop next year, according to them. According to them. We'll uh, see. Which is painful because it's our taxes are based on per people spending. So if you drop a bunch of kids in one year, that really is it hurts. Hard. Yeah, it hurts. So the highest confidence is in the projection of the next three years. They're going to come in because we're new to NASDAQ. They're going to come in at the spring to see what our numbers are in the spring. And then they'll do one, do a projection for us next year as well. It's a relatively small cost for really good information. Is the 24, 25 actual? Like is that that October? That's our October one number? count. Yes. And and is that actual people or is that the way? This is actual people. Okay. Good question. Butts and seats. Yep. To Jake's um, point about <clears throat> about the drop in enrollment, it the this October student count is that the count that is used for next fiscal years. For FY26, yes. Yeah. Oh, right. So it'll be the following year budget that we'll see that. And mm -hmm. how does that number compare to the one we had for the current year budget, the 11 oh, good question. Christina's on it. <laughs> it's knowable. Yeah, it is knowable. I'll keep going. Christina will shout it out at us. Is that okay, Tim? Yes, very good. Okay. Um, I, I do think, I just want to reiterate, our enrollment projection for NASDAQ turned out better than I thought it would. Like, we're, we're going to remain pretty stable, and that's good news. Um, so predicted budget pressures that we can predict as of right now. Last year told us that we couldn't predict everything. But as of right now, these are the ones we know. We're in negotiations with our teachers, the MREA, um, and instructional assistants, which are MRESSA. So anytime you have negotiations, you know that salaries are going to increase. <laughs> Jason just texted me saying we enrolled four new students today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wait, which after October? 1. I know it's after October one. <laughs> so we need to keep them until next October one. Eleven oh five. Oh, this is so, this so is we're bigger. Twenty. So that's good news for our. I mean. Hopefully they are secondary multilingual students. All high school students. <laughs> um, okay. So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam, for making them feel like they belong, because I'm sure you did. Um, so another predicted budget pressure is the continued influence of the weight in new weights on the MRPS um, peoples because we weren't an advantage system under Act 127. But would that would that be um, like a uh, further harm this year, or should that all have come to happen already? The the major harm happened last year, but it's still something like. We're not on a trend line from before 127, right? We're on a new trend line, a new normal for what our per pupil will be. Does that make sense? I think so. Like, whereas before our weighted pupil may have been here before 127, and last year, let's say it was here, right? Or maybe it's the other way. <laughs> but the, now our lines are going at different. We're on, a, we're on a new line. Yeah. A lower line, a lower line. To the yes. lower yeah lines. the lower line would be right yeah but i think jake what you're asking is like that big shift happened last year we're not going to see another big shift the line itself isn't gonna right we should go up or we shouldn't see that yeah it will just be influenced by the number of kids we have right what their weights are yep um dollar yield projections they're they're doing, and I'll look at Jill for this, they're doing a different calculation of magic math for the CLA, mm -hmm. which will influence the dollar yield, which I've asked multiple business managers, including my own, to explain to me a few times. And I'm still not quite understanding it, but I think I need to just see it. Jake's nodding his head at me, so he agrees with that <laughs> assessment. Yeah, it's going to do some wild stuff. Um, wild good or wild bad? <laughs> Wild, yeah. wild, good or wild, bad? Yeah. Wild, wild, complicated <laughs> just wild. to think about. Um, wild, to think about. Lower dollar yields is right. what I understand. Our, our CLA 
is going to actually go up a lot. And normally you'd say, that's great. You know, CLA is going up, but um, that's going to be coupled with the dollar yield going down a lot. And the idea is to make like the school district tax rates that we work with more similar to the actual tax rates that people see on their bills. So it's kind of take CLA dropping out of the, the calculation, but the yield is going to go down because of that. Good, good times. Um, our healthcare increase has come in at 11.9%. Um, so we were originally predicting this number to be 16%. So that was, it was a weird day that we were all celebrating it being 11.9% increase, but we were celebrating it because everybody was predicting 16, 17% increase. Um, and then also I think a, predict, a pressure that we have is the statewide narrative regarding cost containment for school budgets. Out of our... Um, out of our governing body for the state, it's all about cost containment. It's not about all the things that are causing the costs to rise that schools have no control over, like mental health services to students, um, like PCB mitigation. Like All of these things are, are things that the schools are now responsible for because we can't say no to kids. Our doors are wide open to whoever walks in, and we need to support them the best we can. And so um, when the statewide narrative is all about cost containment without talking about the pressures that are causing the costs to rise so significantly, that puts a pressure on us um, as an administrative body and as a school board. Olivia, before you move on to the next one, just as a reminder, I think everybody on the board knows this, but maybe folks listening, the health care costs is not anything that the district um, negotiates. It's negotiated at the state yeah. level. Thank you. So that, that number is, there's nothing we can do about that number. Yeah, right. no, Healthcare. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mia. I meant to say that. So the administrative team has talked about lots of priorities and um, how we were going to make decisions moving into this budget process. I mean, we're in a completely different world of how we're actually designing our school budget. Um, we used to all sit around the table and it was actually like super fun. And we'd say like, put every idea up on the board and where are we going? And like, it was a chance for us to dream and innovate and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not where we are right now. And <laughs> these are, we're having very hard conversations as an administrative team um, regarding how do we create a budget that's responsible for our taxpayers and maintain services to kids. Um, those two things are a little bit at odds. So uh, if we're maintaining resources for, our priority is, sorry, is to maintain resources for effective MTSS model in SEL and academics. That is a priority. So we won't be touching that. And we want to abide by the MRPS class size policy. The board is monitoring the class size policy today. You'll see that I wrote that we are in non-compliance, particularly here at the high school with our class size policy. So that is a conversation that we're having as an administrative team and we're, we also need to have it as a, board, a school board. Uh, we'll be looking at the educational quality standards. So one way we kicked off our um, administrative conversation around budgeting is by looking at the education quality standards, which are our have to's, and to make sure that we have those have to's covered financially and with human resources or are we over or are we under in certain areas because that's a document that we have to abide by. And then research back guidelines for staffing levels. So both the EQS and our class size policy have um, class, size, uh, class size numbers in them. Uh, as you know, you can see in my monitoring report, they're a little bit different between the EQS and our class size policy, which is neither here nor there really. It's, it's, they're not that different. Um, the research back guidelines for staffing levels has to do with things like how many kids is a national norm for a special educator to have as a caseload? Um, how many kids is a national norm for a multilingual teacher to have as a caseload or a speech, speech and language pathologist? Because none of these class size policies or the EQS address that in any way. So we pulled in some studies around um, what do national organizations say or what do research what does research say in these areas um, in order to ground us in something when we're looking at the number of humans that we're um, employing for, for positions like those. 
So the, uh, another priority is we need to allow for professional learning and equitable and inclusive classroom instruction as Jess just went over very briefly um, before this presentation. That's a priority for us. We have to maintain professional learning money in order to do that for our kids. We need to sustain safe facilities. We just had a good conversations in the finance committee meeting around um, just this, around our facilities and how do we fund uh, needed improvements for our facilities. We, we know that it is a community value to ensure the continuation of co-curricular activities for our students. And that's anywhere from athletics to drama and music to after-school enrichment opportunities for kids. We know that's a, that's a commitment this district has made and it is also one that our community values highly. Uh, we need to develop a budget that's fiscally responsible for our taxpayers. That means when we look at how to do this, we need to explore all of our systems for efficiencies. Are there places that we have just traditionally had things and people and systems going because that's what we've always done that we could do differently um, in a more efficient manner? Uh, we wanna ensure financial coherence across the buildings. We're not gonna save too much money by looking at our building budgets because it's just not that big of a bu budget <laughs> line item, but there are some areas where um, one school is spending significantly more than another school. And we just wanna know why, is there a reason for that? Is there something in that, that budget line that we don't know about? Um, or is it just because that's how it's always been? So we're looking at literally every line in our budget right now to, to ask those hard questions um, and to ensure this financial coherence and that we know exactly what's in each of those lines. Um, and we need to protect our services that's dedicated to our most vulnerable children and families. So as we talked about earlier, a level funded mental health budget at the state level for multiple years in a row for, makes a, a responsibility on the school system to provide those services. So we need to protect those services because they're not going to get them anywhere else. And that's not okay for kids and families. So these are administration recommended priorities to the school board. And now it's up for board discussion. Before we get into that, just so I don't forget, just a reminder that the next meeting, um, we'll be talking about our overview of the uh, communication and engagement plan with our community. Talking about opportunities, our plan and actions we wanna take. And, and as you think about our next um, meeting, be thinking about what data or information does the board need going into this budget season to make some good decisions. But now I would love to open it up for board discussion. Yeah, no, um, thank you for that, Libby, super informative. Yeah, so discussion again, you know, as, as Libby said, information we need, thoughts on the priorities, uh, kind of other things that we would like to have guidance as we go into this process. I'm curious how the um, additional students and the revenue associated with them balances against the, the 5.2 increased status quo budget. So does that, is that meaningful, the additional revenues that would come from from the 20 extra students this year, is it is it not meaningful when it, when it comes to a sort of bottom line impact on? We won't know that for a little while because we get that number from the state. And all joking aside, it does matter what type of students it, student right. it is. If it's a pretty, if it's a typical elementary school student, we don't get a whole like that's not a weighted value. Um, if it's a secondary, typical if you're functioning um, secondary student, we get more, okay. right? So it, it really depends on where, who those kids are okay. to be able to answer that question. And we won't know that until we get our equalized weighted pupils from the agency of education, which we generally get on near. So that seems like a good question to put under the, yeah. what data does the board need? Yeah, the administration that, needs that data too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it could like, just so we bring it back yep. then in a future meeting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think it's, you know, it bears repeating that we don't even have firm numbers until oftentimes after we have to make a decision. Right, yeah. come up here, Christina. The, 
the community can't hear you if you're not in front of a microphone. <laughs> Um, so equalized tables, we usually get four or five drafts. We've historically gotten the final draft in January, right before you're approving your budget. So it's always a moving target. And then the other moving target is the dollar yield opt-in. Although it doesn't change that much. Usually in a typical year, it just changed a lot last year. Yeah, after last year, I <laughs> no predictions there. <laughs> Maybe, um, you know, I'm also interested in, in her people spending more than budget total. Um, and I know that we have, we definitely have final numbers for FY25 uh, using long-term weighted ABM. Maybe for FY26, like we could have an estimate, you know, like if we know that our counts in October are up by 20, we could just apply some ratio, like, you know, our ADM last year was something compared to our long-term weighted ADM. So we'll assume the same, you know, um, in the, while we're waiting for AOE to prepare it. Did, it, did that make sense? Like an I estimate just, of our- Honestly, of our... the thought going through my head right now, Jake, was I love math guys who are like, oh, you just apply a ratio. <laughs> or, and, I'm, and I was like, I hope Christina knows what he's <laughs> referring to, which I'm sure she does. <laughs> Yeah, She's like a, a, a ballpark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm anticipating the first draft of the budget, that first meeting in December, that we'll have some equalized pupil number by then. Okay. So. Oh, we would have the from the AOE. Yeah, so we could get you know the budget presentation AOE. down to the step oh, of good. the Ed spending yeah. per long term weighted average daily membership. So we'll, and we would have that compared to last year's, mm -hmm. which would be uh, rooted in the smaller number of butts and seats than we have this year it just i'm just trying to follow the logic of it'll be large it's more, more. so I, right. I, I, more it's gonna yeah i know i was saying last year's would be small yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we're all oh, saying okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yes and we'll we'll we better be able to compare because last year we were kind of doing apples and oranges with the change yeah oh, right. we were doing apples to oranges with the dollar yield yeah um this year it should be apples to apples so even though there, last year was the first year of this new waiting, I think uh, one of the slides where you had um, like our budget um, over the course of the last what, five or six budget years, mm -hmm. um, adding the per pupil spend, adding a column that, that's per pupil spending associated with each of those years, I think is helpful in communicating to our community oh. like what we actually like what what we have control over as a board, as I understand it, is per people spending, right? Education spending, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so if we can say this is our per pupil spending over the last six years, granted, you know, with the asterisks that last year we had this new waiting. Um, I, yeah, I think that would be a helpful piece of information. I'm interested, this is putting the board on the spot, but I'm interested in um, the board's uh, perception regarding where we should try to come in at for our first draft. For Ed spending. Per mm -hmm. I don't I have a number, but conceptually, I think for a first draft, I love what you're saying about finding efficiencies and being really thoughtful in that respect and, and <clears throat> would love to see any of those ideas that you think are, are valuable. But I don't, I think I prefer not to see like aggressive cuts or anything in an initial draft. I'd like to see what the administration team thinks is the right fit for the, for the district without kind of working towards a target that may have like two aggressive cuts or anything. Mm -hmm. I think okay. I like to see the picture of the need first. Mm -hmm. I just want to hear what you're saying. Yeah, Vera. I don't want to disagree, but um, I think I think it'd be great to see a lot of different options because last year there was a healthy amount of panic, and I think or an unhealthy amount of panic. <laughs> and, um, it's unhealthy for my health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not healthy for any of us. And so I, I feel like we were not able to look at as many possibilities as 
it would be nice to be able to discuss when we have like a full timeline without the like changes oh my god Act yeah 27 so like obviously i do not want to cut anything because i think everybody in these buildings does awesome work but i do worry that with the health insurance increasing so much and all these other pressures that i'm looking at right now that that we won't be able to make a budget that will pass without making cuts I really hope that we can find a way, but I think it would be good to see a lot of different possibilities for uh, finding new ways to make systems more efficient, but also just different possible outcomes of this. Because I would like to be able to discuss a lot of them with the time that we do have this year. Other thoughts? Other thoughts? Okay, right. So are you asking for a number of presentation options? Yeah. Okay. She's that would be great. That's that what I hear. Yeah. I think that would be really helpful. I'm wondering for the first draft of um, not looking at specific reductions because that causes mm -hmm. panic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and crisis, which may not need to be caused, but rather looking at if we were to reduce by this number, this is the outcome. If we were to reduce by this number, this is the outcome. If we were to remain level funded with no this reductions, is the outcome. this is the outcome. Yeah. Okay. And how, how Very is, big picture numbers are saying. Very, but yeah. And how is that different from a panic perspective? Because if we say we will be cutting 2.0 FTE from MREA, and this is where it's coming from, and then it causes people to start getting very nervous. Yeah. Yeah, I know that that I see, but if you if you show two different scenarios, and the first question is where the cuts coming from. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it that is essentially <laughs> yeah. I'm having deja vu of what we did last year. It was like a certain section of the cuts were coming from trans. I remember like one of your presentations, yeah. like a bit of it came from transportation, a bit of it from salaries and benefits. Okay. And then we were wondering, okay, well, what do you mean by all that? But yeah. yeah. And it's one of the reasons why we have, sorry, man. No, that's okay. I, I, just to, I just wanted to make sure Jim saw Scott does stand up. Um, it's one of the reasons why. Uh, we did kind of like, how is our budget broken up? Yeah. Right? That slide, which I'm looking at and you guys can't see. <laughs> Hold on one second. Um, because like the, the board and the administrator, like this is what we have control over, right? This is not our entire budget. This is what we have control over. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put this out there right in the get-go, right in the front. So, so I guess my question is, could you make one of the scenarios general enough that you just, you said something like, we have discussed it and, and there might be two to three positions yeah. across the board. Yeah. Across the district. De across the district. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that way you're not saying like, you know, if we cut the two, Underwater basket weaving teachers, then which we don't have to, <laughs> yeah. not a position, not a which, position. Is, which is why I said it. Uh, <laughs> Just want to make that clear, <laughs> yeah. So that way, you know, no one looks at me like, oh, that's me, yeah, yeah, right. when they don't necessarily have to feel that, yeah, right. Isn't, isn't the figure on slide uh, 11, isn't that kind of the budget with no? No additions or reductions already. Are we looking? Which one at are you looking at? Probably that. Oh, this there one. Yeah. Yes. This is this is the budget with no addition and making some assumptions with negotiations. Okay. So are you asking us for the next meeting? What like, and it is five point like what do you what what would you like us to do from here? So the question really is, is this what you want to see in the first draft? 
you know, our best assumptions of what that budget's going to be with no reductions and no additions. Or I think as Miriam was suggesting, yeah, show us that budget and then give us some, like, show us what reductions would be or additions would be if we want to make additions too. If you add $100,000 to your budget, what's it do to the overall percent increase? What's it, you know? Okay. I'm very interested in, in per people spending most of all. It's, that's, what, that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, and I know that in, at the state level, some people uh, have stated that a 5% per spending increase is like doable. You know, the Ed Fund could absorb it and like, you know, the policymakers will meet you halfway. I forget what the wording was, but like to me, that seems like a reasonable target. And we might be below we've that. Never right thought of, yeah, we've never have we thought about it in that way. No, but for reference, going from FY24 to 25, the Ed spending for long-term weighted ADM was 3.29. From 24 to 25? Yeah, what we passed this year. So it was below the 5% if that's oh, target. Because they, sorry, is that because they calculated FY24 long-term weighted ADM for us? And it, yes. yeah. And it yeah. only went up we, 3.9, 3, it only went up 3.29. So there's lots of Just things so that we compare. Factors, so we yeah. compare the general budget, you know, was a 6.8% increase. Um, and then Ed spending was a 5.36% increase. And then you get down to the Ed spending per pupil, and that was 3.29. It still came in as a 15% tax increase. 15.5 for Montpelier and 5.17 for the Roxbury. Yeah. Also, um, our penny discount, it's not going to be eight cents next year. It's going to be something bigger. Um, because Say more of about that. that. Because yeah, of the, it made no sense to me. What? I said, I said that flew right over my head. Yeah, tell me more about yeah. that. <laughs> um, because of the changes to CLA and yield using the statewide adjustment, we, had to act, we have to adjust penny discounts too, or else the math doesn't work. So it's going to be penny adjustment divided by, or the penny like divided by the statewide adjustment. So instead of eight cents, it's going to be, I don't know, 10 cents again or something. Huh. When's everybody going to know about that? Um, December 1st. Letter. Right now. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you get a uh, sneak peek or whatever it's called. Can you give us a reminder of when that gets, a, gets factored into the equation? Yeah, so you take your per people spending, uh -huh. divide by the yield. That's your district school district tax rate. And then yeah. you subtract your... So right at the end. end, right at the end. Yeah, oh, that's and then nice. there's before that, the CLA. and then it gets adjusted oh, by some CLAs. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's before the CLA. Right. Interesting. <laughs> what else is the December 1st letter? I know, anything else you want to share, Jake Feldman? I don't know. It's the gnarly one. <laughs> I am the luckiest business manager in the state. I know. <laughs> I know. She's not being facetious on that either. So I heard an expression the other day that that um, level level programming instead of we've been saying I'm hearing people refer to it as level level funding, right? But but if the the projection that that you included, right, uh, that's what five point whatever percent, right? That's not level funding. That's right. increasing funding, but it's level programming. It's it's yeah. no cuts or, or no additions right. or cuts to right. what, right. We're, what we're providing. And so I do think it's helpful to not say when when we want to say level programming to to say that mm -hmm. instead of level funding. Yeah. Um, again, thinking about how we communicate. Um, oh, and I really like. I like that as a starting point, right? Like if we keep keep things, keep as we're going, what's it gonna be projected for next year? And then maybe um, like some, like what are, what are the impacts of certain potential um, changes to the budget, right? So I, in the past, like you've said, um, you know, adding a person or taking away a person is, is a hundred and whatever, 20, 000, thousand, yeah. you know, so, so we can understand we have this level program budget. And then as we do X, Y, and Z, what it might potentially do to that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, a, a teaching position now is about one hundred to one hundred twenty thousand dollars, depending on the teacher. Well, the average. Yeah, what I do is go right to the center of the salary schedule, and then I do either a two-person or family plan. Sixty-five percent of our teachers are at the end of the scale, which is a great thing. We have veteran teachers; it's fantastic. Yeah. It's also extremely expensive. And it's also expensive. Yeah. So, is there any thought to buyouts here? Yeah, Christine and I have talked about that. She. Had Yeah, I think, um, like Scott was saying, I would love to hear more about, I don't know, maybe this shows how much of a, not a math person I am, but the numbers, I would love to know as much as you can tell us without inspiring panic, what those numbers, what those number cuts look like in our systems, because I also know that a cut of a certain amount of money from one department or one school might look a lot different from one from another. Um, and I don't know how much it's the board's place to make those decisions, but I think those are good things to talk about as well. Um, obviously, again, I don't want us to have to make cuts, but if we do, um, it'd be good to know what the impact of that is going to be on specific systems and student experiences. Libby, I was looking at that one of the last slides where you had the priorities. Um, and what struck me is as I was reading through that, that checklist of priorities, um, like what, like that's everything, right? There's the, like like everything that that we do in this district is a priority, right? and yeah, so, there's not a lot of fluff. Yeah, so it's like all right, not to do this now, but like like could you even go through and say, all right, well, where what are the things that we're doing that are not in that priority list? And and I mean, I think that goes to to your point about schools are being asked to do more and more. Yeah, um, I there we're looking closely at our class size policy at the national averages for certain things and we're above them in, in many areas. So there are places that I think we could we could um, look at that wouldn't, wouldn't hurt any of these other priorities, um, wouldn't change the student experience a tremendous amount. Uh, so there are most definitely places that we have identified that we're asking questions about right now so the way we're, one of the things I learned last year from the process that we didn't really have time to do last year was to ask the quite like ask the questions. Could MRPS do this? What would be the what would be the predicted ramifications that we need to think about? Um, the good and the bad, right? Like all choices have consequences. So could we could we function this way using? this amount of personnel? Could we function this way using this amount of, like, we're asking all those questions right now. We're getting initial feedback that I'm having from the whole group, which was done uh, via quiet brainstorming. So one voice couldn't overtake others. Um, and everybody's voices were heard for me, right? <laughs> so we did quiet written brainstorming around about nine of those questions the other day. I have all of those notes, I've written them up for people to look at, to see what everybody said. Um, and then I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations more specifically with leaders to see um, as they've been able to let those ideas percolate in their head, what else have they thought of? Um, and it's not necessarily whole positions. It's maybe, um, it might be like, could they could positions function and do the work they need to do in a certain in a different schedule you know that kind of thing so it's wide ranging but we're really going at this with a much different mindset and process than we have in the past so when any decision we bring to the board will not have been made lightly or with little time like we've thought about them i i'm glad you brought up the that list of priorities. Libby, can you get it back up on the yeah. screen again and for folks that who are watching at home? Because 
that's the recommendation from the administration. We as a board could say, I am not suggesting this, but you know what? Deprioritize safe facilities for now. And actually we want you, we want to see a budget that has a higher priority of being fiscally responsible than having safe facilities. So that, that is another thing. Or, or we could say as a board, these look really good to us. Yes, use these priorities when you're having those conversations. But today would be the day for us to share that, vocalize that. If there's something on there that you disagree with or there's something you think is missing, this is the day to, to say that. Because what I hear Libby saying is that these are, you know, this is what they're recommending to us and also saying, here's how we're thinking about this right now in these very early stages. Makes sense to me. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think another thing to think about is that um, we had federal money that added positions that moved into the full budget, and some of those positions were originally not going to, you know, they were they were maybe they were time limited or they were. I don't know. There was there was there was a there was a there was some discussion that they would be time limited, that they wouldn't become part of the full budget, um, and or that they would have a sundown or sunset on them, and um, we we want a flywheel to spin, you know. Um, so I don't know if there's a way that any of that yeah the, is that too specific no 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 no. no. I, I hear what you're saying some of those positions the positions that I recall most that we were hoping anticipating predicting of a sunset would be our rise thrive shine positions for our high intensity um, low incident mental health needs and we still need them yeah or we still need them so um, that is part of the challenge. Like it's part of the challenge when I testified at the legislature last year, when people talk about just that, right? That we added positions using federal dollars and we kept those positions because the need hasn't gone away. <laughs> you know, so just because the federal dollars doesn't go away, the need doesn't go away. Um, so until other areas in the state are attended to, I keep harping on mental health. As, as I'm speaking to the choir right here around that topic, um, we need to continue to support our kids and families and keep them in school because that's the place they belong, right? We need to offer the support in order to keep them here, which is way more intensive than a, than a typically functioning kid. I Are there cost offsets for any of these types of things? Grants and or... or like, if pre what if what if pre K was a full day program? Could it pull kids in from the region and create a revenue source? It would only or? make sense if they change the weights for a pre K child. Right now, a pre K child is half a half a kid. Which sounds awful to say, but <laughs> that in it doesn't way. yeah it doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. Well, they are quite small. <laughs> Yeah. I invite anybody to be in a room with 15 three-year-olds, four-year-olds at the same time. <laughs> no, I know. Libby, I'm wondering if there's a way, I, I think the things on the list are great, and I'm wondering if there's a way to prioritize them so that when the board's thinking about, from your perspective as the overseer, what are the most important things on that list and if we have to think about budget cuts where should we maybe look i'd say they are all as scott said earlier important the smaller the indents are the what was and uh, me and jim gave feedback on this before those were parameters for reductions before okay so um if we were to make reductions for instance, in um, faculty, we would abide by our class size. That would be one place that we would be looking to see where could that happen, mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, 
if we were to make reductions elsewhere or in staff, we'd be looking at our systems for efficiency. That we could do similar work with less humans. Mm -hmm. Or could we do it, you know, we we made the decision a couple of years ago, a few years ago, to remove a um a position that had to do with data and student data because we outsourced it for much less money. Outsourced it to a company for much less money. Are there areas that we can do that? Mm -hmm. Monty's hands up. I don't really see how all these things are important. I see why they're recommended. But I'm also like looking at this list and feeling like there's a lot on there. And if there's a way to, I don't know if consolidate is possible because I see that there's already efforts to do that. But um, if we do have more time to think and talk about this. I wonder how we could maybe take a little pressure off some of the either priorities or the the need to like start making these decisive decisions if we're still like having these conversations before the first draft is due in two weeks. Well, we're not going to see a first draft in two weeks, right? We're going to keep talking about it in two weeks. We're going to talk about, uh, no, we're going to be talking about communication in two weeks. So the first draft, and this is super drafty, the mm -hmm. first one, it mm -hmm. often changes significantly from the first to the third or fourth draft that the board sees is on the first December meeting. So it's not next meeting, it's the first December meeting. And it's like, I mean, there's numbers we don't have from the state yet or there's, we, we don't know a lot then, so we're making a lot of assumptions in that first draft. So it changes significantly. The, where the board needs to like, where the rubber meets the road is the, is the January meetings <laughs> where decisions really have to be made. So all through that, you all will be giving uh, me feedback and Christina feedback as to what we wanna do. Um, I didn't, I don't do this to make things harder for teachers from looking over, but um, is there a way to put together a number that would be reflective of a different classroom size policy or, or a policy that was closer to the national average or something like that? Like, is that a, is that a, is that a data is that a sort of number or a, um, a framework that other board members would be interested in seeing from a very high up level? You mean change our class size policy? Yes. Like if it look if it were closer to the national average, what would what might that do for the overall budget? And would that be something that other board members would be interested in seeing, just as a comparison? I think that's a good question. And I think national average is one data point for us, but our what I'm hearing is our educational quality standards is something for our state. It's like the requirement of the state. So I don't think our class size policy, we want to deviate from that too far. And I think right now it's, they're pretty close. They're, they're pretty close. I have the exact language in the policy monitoring document yeah. where it's different. There's also, a, it, it's the legislature may they may talk about it. They may talk about it. It gets really tricky because yeah. talking about staff per pupil, which staff, you know, yeah. Um, that yeah, and I don't want to. It gets super out. tricky. Just, just trying to think about different ways of looking at what what different structural structural budget, uh, you know, what it might look like. I mean, I think it's a. I don't know about this cycle. Um, because I think it does need to be thoughtfully and I've done thoughtfully and I don't know if we have time to do it thoughtfully, but I think as we look maybe from years out, I think looking at class size policy, especially if the state does not do it, um, makes makes sense, but, I, but doing it with input and with time. And just to put my two cents in as a, 
longtime educator, our class size policy isn't that too far off yeah. from what a good class size policy should be. Like, I would think it it's a pretty reasonable class size policy. And in, in my from coming from my third year of teaching, where I had forty first graders in my room, yeah. you know, so New York City, and then forty fourth graders the next year. There's also like a, a mathematical limitation, like just being a smaller district, where if you want to offer some course, like there just may not be twenty two yeah. or whatever kids yeah. Yeah. who can take that course. So what are your options there? Like, do you not offer that course? Do you blend them in with some other class which is vaguely related? You know, yeah. so there's a sacrifice. And, and <laughs> like in some other big district in, you know, like Chicago or something, they may have different factors yeah. so that they can they can yeah. do that. Yeah, and Jason and crew here at the high school in particular, because that really influences the high school more than the other buildings. Um, a little bit the middle school, but mostly the high school. Jason and crew are looking at that right now. Yeah, yeah and, and some other things kind of on, on that side too. I mean, obviously, you know, there's, there's the merger conversation which we hope to have going, but even kind of short of that, you know, perhaps looking at nearby schools and because a lot of the smaller class is in the high school, um and seeing if there's a possibility just to do you know some sort of combined classes um for classes. Libby, I'm wondering, um, of course the policy tells us ideal, but it doesn't tell us what we actually have. Yeah. And I'm wondering um which might be a nice segue into policy monitoring. Could we also have the policy monitoring reports? Oh no, so I'm I'm oh. curious about how close we are to the numbers in here like do we have a number of classes that have few students in them yeah so or... it's in your policy monitoring document oh i'm looking at the table but we have two things before that right yep um, i'm also wondering like last year, we were we were originally looking at the implementation of the new weights over time, and so I'm also wondering if it would be worthwhile to sort of say what would a flat is it too hard to predict two years out? Of, like if it was flat, is it are there too many variables to say level programming? If, is that if, if everything was level, yes, um, or you know if we were at the plus five point two in 27 or whatever years we're looking at, I get confused about the actual years. Yeah, so you're ahead. 27, yeah. you're correct. You're right. Yeah. Um, if it remained flat, could we predict that? Is it too too many factors because the, I'd say the legislatures once, get in their, may or may not get their hands dirty there? Yeah, it depends know. what the commission does and what the legislator does with It'll it. Come up with another study and another commission. Maybe. Probably. Um, and it also depends on negotiations too. Right. It, we, we, that's a that's a factor that we, we weren't considering us flash. So yeah, there's a couple there's a couple of factors we we could try to put that out there, but it would be super estimating. Really high. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Do you think you have the guidance you need for yeah. round two? Okay. Yeah. If the board, if anything else comes in the board's head, shoot me an email. Yeah. Give me a call. Um, so I know I have votes. The finance committee, fourth quarter, FY report, or school year 24, fourth quarter report, and school year 25, first quarter report. Yeah. Um, Turn over to whoever wants to talk to the finance committee, and it sounds like we need to uh, perhaps approve those. Our, our chair just like. <laughs> no. He'll be back. He'll be back. Do you guys want to give an overview? Without my mouth full. Jake's just sitting yeah. there quietly. He's letting you suffer. Don't we look perfect, Tommy? He is. You're on the spot. You ready to make your motion? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We're on <laughs> just financial reports. Uh, yeah, well, the, well um, the finance committee, you guys haven't talked about this yet. All right, the finance committee just met um, 
we reviewed last year's unaudited financials as well as FY25 first quarter financials. Um, very fortunate to have Christina uh, overseeing the district FISC and providing an overview. Um, a couple things that I guess I just highlight that I thought were um, good news. I mean, at a high level, uh, no real concerns were reported for either fiscal 24 or the start of fiscal 25. Um, we talked about uh, a few different pieces. Rhett, there's one thing you talked about about other revenue, and I, I guess I didn't really realize this, but we do derive um, over $100,000 of revenue from uh, students who want to come to our district. Um, and that's uh, unexpected over what was budgeted for. So that both in fiscal 24 and 25, that's a good news revenue picture um, to the tune of over $100,000. Um, Christina, I guess I'll ask you, I don't know, there is one tweak and a formula on the fund balance page. So um, I don't know if you wanted to articulate what that is to the board, because that's just the one piece um, before we move approval that I think it bears noting. The correction? Yeah. Yeah. So um, please note on the fund balance page, there's an error in my formula. Um, the MHS track project, where it says 162,000, that should be the, the original committed amount of 400,000. And that's the third page of each report. Oh, both of them. Okay. Yeah. Say the number again, please. So under the committed fund balance for the MHS track project, the 162,000 needs to be 400,000. Oh, okay. I see it. The original committed. <clears throat> and so it reduces the unanticipated unreserved to about 2.5. Yeah. And I'll be sending out a corrected version Got it. in the morning. Um, Does that also then uh, change the amount over 2% limit? That number would change as well, right? That's yeah. relevant to the budget, 2% budget. Right, but if the, th what, so the currently 3.22, yes. yes. yeah, 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 okay, thank you. So that'd be 1.9. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and good news too from last year was that, I guess we had to put um, 400,000 be reserved for the, um, from the fund to utilize in 24, and we only needed to use $240,000, so. Um, that's okay. good. Um, what else? Um, I'll look to colleagues in the finance. I think that insurance funds and FEMA funds have come through um, in a way that um, has met expenses. So that was a good news story. So I thought it was a good report. Um, it was very well presented, really appreciate it. And so with the revision articulated by Christina, I would um, move approval of both the uh, fiscal 24 and the uh, first quarter fiscal 25 financial reports. Second. Any discussion or questions for finance committee or otherwise, Mia? I have a, a couple of questions, maybe for the committee, maybe for, maybe for you, Christina. Um, Tim, I think I just heard you say we have been fully re reimbursed for the costs of the that we incurred from the 2023 flood. Yeah, if and then 100 percent dark close, right? Okay. There's a few thousand for not providing. Okay, so that's just really interesting to think about as we consider a future where more flooding will occur in this building. Obviously, there's lots of reasons to worry about flooding this building, but me, but we didn't have to like it wasn't a big drain on our budget necessarily financially. There's a lot, like I said, a lot more that goes into recovering from a flood than just the finances. But it's just interesting to note that, and I don't know, does that mean that would be the same case in the future? We're not sure, but that's. Yeah, I'm not sure if we qualify for FEMA again. Yeah, okay. Um, I noticed the general ed line item is for the, in the first quarter report, we've spent 67%. Is that normal? So there's. I've changed a little bit about how I'm reporting. Um, what we're doing now is encumbering all of the salaries 
um, so oh. contracted so we can get a better idea of the year on projection. Uh -huh. um, you're used to seeing this quarter compared to last year's quarter. Uh -huh. I feel like a more helpful report for the board is to see how we're going to end the year and start doing uh, planning for the year end. Got it. Okay. So, Mia, yeah, I asked almost the exact same question, and I think the, the, the key word there is contracted, right? Because that is it the non-contracted employees you can't encumber? Is that what, um, you, what was your answer? Because your answer so made a lot of sense. Our software won't let us encumber hourly That's paid okay. employees. Okay. So it does look like we have a, a big balance there. We are planning to spend all the salary and benefits. It just helps us um, give a better projection. Got it. Okay. I also noticed that our budget in <clears throat> FY24 includes anticipation of $30,000 in interest payments, but we only earned $22,000. Um, and then we also are anticipating $30,000 in interest payments in the FY25 budget, but you're, but we have a smaller fund balance. So could, as we plan FY26, maybe we should probably plan for less than yes, $30,000. I mean, I realize this is $8,000 in a $32 million budget is probably not... <laughs> Yeah, but, but as you mentioned, we do have a shrinking fund balance. So yeah. Our interest is not returning like we thought. Yeah. And then my last question is a is more of a request. Um, I saw that in we don't we didn't have any numbers in the first quarter for um, enrichment income, which makes sense because um, we didn't you know hadn't recorded that yet. But it is something that I think we want to be paying attention to as we build the budget from of the enrichment that we offer, we do ask caregivers to, to pay for some of that. And we have the, the sliding scale at the middle school and at um, RVS right now for the, the enrichment that's going on in both places. And I think it would be helpful for the board to see what, because it is a, it is a um, cost and an investment of the district in co-curricular and enrichment, what also are we getting as revenue um, there? Just as we think about next year's budget. Could we see, even if they're not, even if it's not in a fiscal quarterly audit, you know, report, but if, if we could just have that number. Sure. Did you notice the um, enrichment revenue line? So it's reported for FY24, but like you said, right. FY25, we haven't seen. Right. And I, I don't think we're going to see, will we see a, a second quarter report before we finalize the budget? Okay. Maybe we will. Yeah. yeah. Make that happen. Just if we don't actually see the second quarter finance report, which would have that would have that line filled out, sure. if we could still have that, what are we getting in revenue currently so far this year would be helpful for us to know. Yeah, we'll be able to have projections. Yeah, quarter two is not till February, so we won't have the act the full the full report. But if we could just have yep. that as we think about the ex the co curriculars and the enrichment that we're offering. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, there was also the uh, financial management. Sorry, if folks have questions on the financials. I just didn't want to lose the financial management. Oh, right. Oh, I think we need to. Okay. Do we have a motion? Do we have to well, well, vote on uh, it? One question is the. Um, there's a. It says. Other after school revenue budget, 120,000. Mm -hmm. That's for both the middle school and the RVS programs. Well, that, that, that's what I was hoping to right, get as this, revenue in this year, in the whole year. Just understanding, not part two separate. No, part two is separate. separate. Okay. Right. All's in favor of approving just have to, for the two financials. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and then do you have a motion for the management questionnaire? Do we need a motion for that or just need to be aware of that? I'd be pleased to make that motion. All right, great. So um, motion made, second. Discussion, questions, comments, editorials, quantifications. All's in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There are some funny questions in there. Yes. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so yes. much, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Um, thank you, Christina. Do you want to do the Roxbury Village survey? 
that to me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the board has an overview of the res oh, sorry. Yeah. Looking at it. It's helpful. The board has an overview. Let's see if we can make this bigger. Of the uh, survey that was conducted. Um, just a little background. The merger document is linked in there in case anybody is interesting, interested in that. 293 community members filled out the survey. This is the results of that, 67.9%. Um, leaned toward MRPS offering the building to the town of Roxbury for a dollar as stated in the merger agreement. Um, and these were just, what I did was I took all the survey responses, which there were 94 of them. And of course, people, when they're responding to an open-ended question, didn't just say one thing in their comments. Some people did, but often there are three different ideas, for instance, in one comment. So just keep that in mind, that the percentages doesn't exactly equal 10% of 94. Um, so I just kind of did a really simple tally mark of just big themes that came out, slightly less Less than half of the survey participants, I think it was 48%, so just slightly below the 50% mark, um, reiterated the idea of selling or giving the building back to the town of Roxbury with, for a variety of reasons, um, some of which didn't want to um, spend more money on the Roxbury Village, Village Schools, some of which thought that it was the right thing to do to give to the town of Roxbury, um, and that the community uses were the best thing for that building and only the citizens of Roxbury could make that decision. Um, so there were a multitude of reasons that people presented there. Uh, less than 10% of the respondents stated um, a desire to have the citizens of Roxbury decide because it influences them most, um, but they didn't have enough information to weigh in. And there was a, a, a desire to unmerge the two towns um, approximately 5% of the respondents stated that uh, there was a definite understanding for the need of after school activities in Roxbury, a desire for MRPS to run a community center for the town and the building, a desire to give the citizens of Roxbury more time to develop a plan for the building. So those were the overall themes that I pulled out um, that were, you know, over or near 5% at least. There are some other random comments as well that didn't fit in one of those buckets, but those were the main buckets that I took from it, keeping in mind that it's what I took from it and that's my, you know, I pulled out and somebody else might have other perspectives of what people said. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Any questions or comments on that? And again, we'll, we'll take that up at the 16th. I think our hope is to yeah. have a Both. full conversation on the 16th and ideally and make a decision, decision. Yeah. Um, as to between. So right now the board is weighing, those are the three, the three options that were in the survey yeah. are the ones that the board says are still on the table. Yeah. Um, so. And, and the again, 20th, the survey is the information 20th, right. is not, you know, that, that is not determinative. We're not going to. Right. We're, we're taking the, you know, it's a feedback. It's yeah. a way that we've asked the community to engage with this decision-making process. And it, I, I would encourage the board to take it into consideration just the same as we got all the community feedback from when we were in Roxbury, the different um, questions we asked Libby to, to look into, the questions we asked the lawyer. So the, some of those in, um, influenced how we got to where we are currently with the three options. And now we are, we still have to make the decision, mm -hmm. go from three to one. <laughs> Jim, Jim um, so I guess I want some clarification around the, the decision. So right now, if the board does nothing, right, we, I, don't, I guess I'm not sure we need to make a decision right away, right? We, we understand from the email that the town of Roxbury is going to be well. Well, let him finish. I'm sorry. I was, um, just, I was just going to clarify that. I think they've got authority to go to the voters. Uh huh. I'm. We might want to try to have a discussion. I'm not. I, I think whether or not it's a 
whether or not we want to offer the building to them might uh -huh. influence whether they do that. I think I understand. So, so, so they might not go to the voters if they think we're going to keep the school. Tom Frazier is right in terms of the merger agreement. This, uh -huh. What Tom said in public comment earlier, okay. the steps are that the school we board have to decide decides first. if there's an educational use for the building. Yeah. Then gotcha. the school district decides. Okay, that's helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. To offer the building to Roxbury mm -hmm. for a dollar, then Roxbury gets to decide if they want to take it. Gotcha. Yes. But there is a definitive one, two, three. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So I was once again wrong. Could, could you ask the question? Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just kind of saw where it was going. Are there any other things that board members would want to know before making a decision at the next meeting that we could ask Libby or anybody about? We make the decision at the next meeting to not include RVS in the budget. Would that be applied this year's budget, like the budget we're about to decide on, or the next one? Can I ask a clarifying question to to Miriam's? The decision that we're making is not about including it in next year's budget. The decision is whether or not we want to offer it back. Yeah, yeah. But that could be this year or next year, depending upon some established timeline. Yeah, like what's the timeline? How, how did the the decision budget? is whether or not the school board believes there's an educational use for the building. Gotcha. That's the decision. Okay. If it's no, then you're kind of unilaterally also saying you're going to offer the building to Roxbury for yeah. a dollar mm -hmm. yeah. because that's the next step in the merger agreement. Mm -hmm. Um, as we are told, and I don't think I'm breaking any executive session rules by saying this, but it, as we are told, um, you know, it's a real estate transaction. And so con contractually that takes time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are not going to let a building that is in our possession <laughs> to go to shot over that. So yep. there, it will take time for that transaction to take place. It's a negotiation. Right. So if the board decides that there isn't an educational use and we offer it to the town of Roxbury, the select board or wherever we're technically offering it, um, if they don't take it, we would sell it theoretically, right? So if we make that decision, will, will the building be included in the budget? It is my belief at this moment in time on November 6th, 2024, and yes. I will hold out the right to change this <laughs> statement <laughs> at any future date yes. publicly <laughs> at a board meeting that most likely because of the timeline of that negotiation and how long real estate transactions of public buildings take, that we will need to put some sort of money into the budget to maintain the building. Great, good to know. Thank you. Did somebody determine whether the after school program um, is or is not an uh, educational purpose? An after school program would most definitely be qualified as an educational purpose. So the decision for the board would be is that the old, that would be the named purpose for the building. And is it worth keeping the building for the after school program? Um, Roxbury, my understanding from the town of Roxbury, from speaking to the citizens there who are planning on the future of building use, a community center idea is the is a beautiful idea, and after school programming is part of that idea. My my, are we talking about like what we think right now, or are we doing that next time? 
We're, we're more doing that next time. I think time. we're more doing that next time. Yeah. <laughs> right, right now we're more, mostly more saying, are there, to, like, face plan. Are, there, are, there, are there information? <laughs> yeah, is there any other information yeah, any other in order to be able to make yeah. a decision? No, I've already made my, my decision. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> if you want to give me a call, Jake, we can talk more. Okay. But don't tell us for yeah, another two weeks. <laughs> you have two weeks to sit on. Yeah, exactly. We, <laughs> it seems we, it was about a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we know the episode is written. We're just we'll we'll, we'll be excited to hear what. <laughs> we I think this was it, um, in the email Rhett shared with board members. Kind of, it was kind of like um, sideways mentioned that the there is some interest in leasing classrooms in the building um, next year. And so it's something that we could, if we are anticipating having the building in our possession because of the amount of time that our, the real estate transaction could take, if we, again, decide that we don't have an educational use and we should sell it to the town for a dollar, we could decide we would want to have there be humans in the building and a revenue source during that time period. So that is something that has been floated to us and seems, you know, it's it, like a possibility. I definitely would not go farther than possibility because anything could happen. Um, but that could be another, it could be a, it could be a potential revenue source for us if we were to hold have the building in our position, whether or not for the for the next year, um, so that would be another thing the board could be interested in hearing more about as part of this conversation. But I think it's still first and foremost up to us to decide whether or not we have deemed there to be an educational use for the district. Um, and all that said, because those possibilities were floated to us. Um, Libby asked uh, Christina to look into what would that be like from an insurance perspective, and we were given guidance that it's not uh, advised for the district. So that could be a more of a conversation we can have after we decide whether or not we think there's an educational use for the building, but we wanted to make sure that board members had all that information, that that is um, understandably the residents of Roxbury who want to see that beautiful vision of a community center are working very hard to make that happen. And, um, you know, so there are lots of different moving pieces around our decision to whether or not, as to whether or not there's an educational use that the district has for the building. So just wanna make sure the board is aware of all of that. So basically what you're saying is that insurance wise, it's not recommended that we just to stay so. Our insurance company rec recommended against it. And we could talk more about that at another board meeting, but we didn't want to like withhold information from the board that it's just good for us to all chew on. That's important to know because there were there were a lot of questions about what that would look like. Like would a lease carry over in the event that ownership transferred? Would it so when it makes the negotiation it, more complicated. Yeah, yeah, it would make it more complicated, which it isn't a bad thing to put people in the building and have a revenue source, but does it foul up the way things might go? That would be unfortunate. That was most definitely current use um, vis a vis the insurance company. Well, we're not renting right. it to anyone right now because we're running the program. Right. And that's, so that's the key issue is the renting it versus self administering. <laughs> Yeah, because they can part because we we have liability with our control. Uh, Anything else on Roxbury? Then finally, we have three policy monitoring reports. Uh, B5, employee unlawful harassment. Um, B6, class size. And C4, limited English proficiency proficiency students. Do I have a um, motion to approve those three monitor reports? I'll, I'll move that we approve them. Do you have a second? 
Um, any discussion or questions about the lottery reports? No? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, motion passes. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll <laughs> <laughs> Everybody fell asleep. Uh, <clears throat> take care of yourselves, everyone. It's been a, a rough day and probably rough time to come. So, um, in my heart. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.